Hello and welcome to Thursday's History Hack. We have a treat for you today. We have with us today Dr. John Wolfe, who uh, is already co-author of uh, Stephen Fry's Victorian Secrets. Uh, but he has a, his own book out um, called The Wonders, which is essentially a study of Victorian freak shows and the culture surrounding them. Um, hello, John. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. No, thank you. How are you doing on Corona lockdown? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. You know, just kind of cracking on, really. Are you another one of these introvert historians who's quite used to just sitting alone all day anyway? Well, you, that's the tragic truth. I'm kind of always self-isolating, whether intentionally or not. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's not too different. But uh, my wife's at home, which is uh, lovely. So that's, uh, yeah, that's been the slight change. And, um, yeah, you know, it's a kind of surreal time to be living through and be concerned about uh, other people. But... For myself, things are things are okay. Tentatively, the numbers were starting to look a bit good yesterday, weren't they? I was, I was actually I was talking to Josh Levine, who was on last week, yesterday about this new story that Russia, North Korea, and China are all reporting no cases, um, and that people are starting to go, "Oh, it's a conspiracy. It just hasn't been put on them." And it was like, or think about it: if you were going to choose three countries that might possibly lie about how many coronavirus cases they had. Would they not be your top three? Absolutely. They'd be right at the top. Fake news, I say. Yeah. Fake news. Josh was saying that the Russians were trying to argue this while conversely telling everyone they'd had this big spike in deaths from pneumonia as well, which I think tells you <laughs> something about the truth of it. But let's talk about the history. Alina, kick us off. So first of all, <clears throat> let's talk about the term freak. We're going to use it. Tell everyone why. Yeah, it's one of those words that's kind of uh, quite unsettling, particularly in the uh, PC age. And a number of people are quite ambivalent about that word freak. And, you know, the truth is I use it in my book and I use it here because it was a term used at the time. In about 1847, the word freak became synonymous with physical difference. But I think, you know, the way in which I navigate this rather tricky issue is to draw in a, a distinction between the freak and the freak performer. Now, the freak is an act, it's an identity, it's a construction which exists on stage and is brought to life by the freak performer, the private individual who has a life off stage, who's essentially an actor embodying the freak character on stage. So to put it really simply, the freak is an act. The freak performer is an actor. And uh, that's kind of a way in which I think we can navigate some of the uh, sensitivities around that term freak. I like it. I did, that makes sense to me. I'm happy to use it. Um, let's look at some of these freaks. Um, there's a common thread because you, you have to start, you look further back than the Victorian age to begin with, mm. don't you? And there's a common thread of like people being royal pets of sorts. And it goes from antiquity right into much more recent history. Um, but let's start in the 17th century with the origins of the freak show. Tell us about Geoffrey Hudson. He's a great example. Who was he and what was his life like? Yeah, Geoffrey Hudson's one of my favourite uh, favorite characters in, in the whole book. And really his story is one you can't make up. Um, kind of 1626, there's this massive banquet uh, in honour of King Charles I and his 15-year-old wife, Queen Henrietta Maria. And, you know, there's theatricals and there's sumptuous food and gifts galore. And at the climax of this banquet, two trumpets blare and footmen enter carrying this magnificent pie. Yes, you heard me, a pie. <laughs> two feet high and two feet wide. And they place this pie between, um, in front of Queen Henrietta Maria. And as if uh, this baked good was in labor, suddenly it begins to move and out pops Geoffrey Hudson, a seven-year-old, 18-inch tall uh, dwarf who's kind of donned in this miniature suit of armor. He marches up and down the banqueting table and takes a bow in front of the queen and kind of thus marking the beginning of a very close and intimate relationship between Geoffrey Hudson and Queen Henrietta Maria. Now he kind of comes from a poor family um, in Oakland, in the county of Rutland in, in the UK. And he is brought into the inner sanctum of royal life. And he spends uh, his formative years with the queen. He's taught uh, hunting. He's given age 21, a salary of 50 pound per annum. 
Um, and his life is really kind of one of those stranger than, than fiction tales because when the English Civil War begins, um, he escapes with the Queen to France and actually fights for the Royalists against the Parliamentarians and gets, the cap uh, gets this title, uh, Captain of the Horse. Um, and I mean, he's got, there's more to his tale if, if you want me to go on, but um, he's one of these characters that really exemplifies a 17th century and earlier trend whereby royal households would bring in these curiosities um, for purposes of uh, entertainment. And Peter the Great does it as well. He, uh, I know he collects dwarves, and I think Frederick the Great of Prussia, someone collects yep. giants, and they do swapsies, don't they? And I, I've read like tales of Peter the Great had a big collection of dwarves. He liked to have one on his lap when he was in his uh, sleigh going places. And also, I remember that, I mean, they were treated like kings themselves. So there was a wedding between two of them, and if all the everybody dressed up in little animal costumes, and and like you say, they became an integral part of a royal household. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, Charles I uh, and Queen Henrietta Maria, they didn't just have Geoffrey Hudson. They had a giant porter named William Evans, uh, who used to perform in, in plays with Geoffrey Hudson. And they had other, uh, other dwarves as well, two of whom uh, were actually married by King Charles I. So it was a real kind of, it was a common thread of royal life. And many of these, many of these dwarves were, you know, as you said, swapped, sold, and even and even bred for royal and aristocratic households. So there's a kind of dark side to it as well. Um, but it's uh, it was certainly a fashion of the time. But not every freak's going to live this kind of luxurious life of Riley. They're shows and entertainments. Uh, they're the precursor to the Victorian freak shows, though, aren't they? And people start to make money out of exhibiting these these people. Tell us about Bartholomew Fair. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you kind of hit the nail on the head there. There's these two routes to the Victorian freak show. One is the royal courts of Europe and the other are these ancient traveling fairs, which had been around since, you know, the medieval times where people would go around selling their goods um, and bringing entertainment to people. And Bartholomew Fair was kind of uh, a great example of these early ancient traveling fairs. And in Bartholomew Fair, it was described by William Wordsworth as a parliament of monsters, where you would see hermaphrodites, dwarves, giants, so-called cannibals and savages who were to, displayed to pleasure seekers uh, in muddy open fields. And these kind of traveling fairs, certainly in the early 19th century, were seen as quite licentious. They were seen as rowdy um, and they kind of carried a bit of a stigma but they were sort of one of the early roots of the Victorian freak show, which emerged as a much more respectable, popular form of entertainment. And tell us about, the, there's a rise in these traveling fairs in the early 19th century in general, isn't there? And living curiosities. I mean, this is degrading work, isn't it? Who was George Sanger? Uh, George Sanger, I mean, he's kind of Britain's Barnum equivalent. And he's one of those characters that has often been forgotten in, in the history of 19th century entertainment. But he was born in 1825 uh, to a father who was a traveling showman who had his own peep show. He would travel around um, in the summer months around the UK, uh, bringing his form of entertainment. And George Sanger grew up with his father. In the winter, he used to sell uh, fruit and veg in a market stall in Newbury. And in the summer, travel around with, with the peep show and he eventually, in 1854, established his own circus. Um, and by the 1860s, he owned sort of 10 permanent circuses around the UK. And in my book, I use his story because luckily he left us with an autobiography that really illuminates the rather sort of dangerous, transitory world of these ancient traveling fairs, where, you know, there was what they called the showman's law. Showmen were seen as social pariahs and outcasts, and they'd often get a lot of bother from police and other locals. And the showmen were kind of united by the pressures of the outside world and would inflict their own form of justice if there had been any injustice afflicted against the community. Um, and George Sanger kind of emerges from this sort of dangerous transitory world to become a very respectable Victorian circus entertainer. Funnily enough, you just mentioned The Greatest Showman. Isn't that a popular film of late. I mean, who was he? Well, <laughs> other than Hugh Jackman. Well, yeah, I mean, P.T. Barnum is, uh, 
is the sort of archetypal Victorian showman. And don't get me wrong, I loved uh, The Greatest Showman, great music, Hugh Gap Jackman's gorgeous, you know, it's great, it's a great, uh, great show. But the, uh, the history is pretty crap, to be honest. Um, and in many ways, like I'm not one of those historians that likes to kind of pick through um, movies to, to find historical inaccuracies. It was trying to do something different. But what was sort of most frustrating was it massively whitewashed uh, the past and P.T. Barnum's life. And, you know, he's sort of portrayed in that film as, as this kind of hero, this savior. And actually there's, there's a lot of blotches on his moral record. He was a slave owner. He was uh, accused of child exploitation, animal exploitation. Um, and no doubt he was a man of his time. He was someone who was central to the uh, entertainment industry and the rise of the freak show. Uh, but, you know, the, the film slightly whitewashed his past. You mentioned, because um, I was about to ask you if he actually, in, in reality, was a bit of a scumbag. Um, Chang and Eng, <laughs> uh, they're conjoined twins. The term Siamese twins actually came from this famous duo, doesn't it? Um, mm. And they were with him, weren't they? How did they feel about their life? Well, so Chang and Eng were, they, again, the film sort of perpetuates this idea that they, uh, there is a, there's a character there um, in the show uh, these two conjoined twins and you they sort of modeled on Chang and Eng and you'd expect Chang and Eng were with Barnum for, for much longer than they actually were they were only with him for a couple of seasons and they didn't like him at all they thought um, he was stingy they thought he was hard to do business with um, and their life kind of their foray into the world of the freak show begins kind of much earlier they were discovered in Siam uh, in today's Thailand in 1824 and they were brought over to the West by a British and American uh, merchant. And they were displayed in America, in New York, in Boston. And then they were brought over to London in 1829, where they performed at the Egyptian Hall. And they were loved. I mean, they really sort of sparked a freak frenzy in London. They were there for like seven months and 100,000 people came to see them. And after that, they were kind of lugged around America by their so-called protectors this American merchant and British merchant. But according to their own letters, and I went to North Carolina where they, they've got their letters, they were mistreated, they were underpaid, um, they were overworked. And when they hit their 21st birthday, they decided they'd had enough and they wanted to become, in their own words, their own men. So they dispensed of their protectors and they go from being kind of freak performers to freak performers plus freak showmen and they manage their own affairs um, and they become very very successful and actually retire from the world of the freak show albeit temporarily to settle in North Carolina so their kind of view of Barnum was uh, not so positive and their view of the freak show um, to be honest it was their way that they made quite a healthy living so they weren't too negative about the world of the freak show. Do you know I was just looking up uh, Joyce Heth she's actually sparked my interest mm. and um it was barnum who was exploiting a really old senile slave woman as george washington's nurse wasn't he and her exploitation even continued in death yeah absolutely and that goes back to this idea of uh, blotches on barnum's moral record so before he'd kind of found freak show fame um he decided in 1835 to exhibit this old paralyzed slave woman named Joyce Heth, who he billed as a 161 year old nurse of George Washington. And he lugged her around the Northeast of America. Obviously she wasn't 161, she, she was very elderly. Um, and she actually died on the job. And when she died, Barnum decided, you know, that he could still make a bit of money from, from her body. So he arranged a public autopsy and about 1,500 people came, um, and Barnum made a lot of money off that. There was this public dissection, and it was revealed that, of course, she was 161 years old. She was more like 80. But Barnum really capitalized on that. He spread all of these rumors about Joyce Heth. Was she, was she 161 years old? No, she wasn't 161 years old. And this kind of propelled him uh, into popular culture, and in particular, the penny press. Um, no one knows what happened to poor Joyce Heth's body, uh, but Barnum kind of found fame on the back of her. And uh, that was sort of what really propelled him into the world of 19th century entertainment. 
and it's a story that's conveniently dropped from the greater showman film yeah i mean he moves a different way after the the those acts doesn't he why mm. um, he opens a museum doesn't he and, and why is it a game changer for the freak show industry and how influential is he in the rise of them yeah so before it, it, this is in 1841 he purchases the american museum uh in the heart of new york and as you say, that was really a game changer because before then he was really an itinerant, itinerant traveling showman, you know, peddling slaves, builders, nurses of George Washington. He was with a traveling circus. But once he gets the American Museum, um, he has stability, permanency, and he kind of totally transforms this museum into a palace of wonders, which is um, accessible, to all classes, it cost 25 cents admission. You would go in and you could see freak shows, you could see um, menageries, you could see taxidermy, historical artifacts. And it kind of became the springboard for him to propel himself into the world of uh, Victorian entertainment. And what's so important about the American Museum in terms of the history of the freak show is he ensured that freak displays were at the heart of the American Museum, which was presented as respectable, clean, a safe environment. So more people like the middle classes came to see the American Museum, they met the freak performers, and that helped turn the freak show into this kind of respectable, popular form of entertainment. Whereas before it was associated with these ancient traveling fairs and seen as rather sort of rowdy, licentious, and carrying a stigma. So Barnum was absolutely crucial in that transformation and the American Museum uh, looms large in, in the history of the freak show. Carrying on this whole thing about Barnum, because um, <clears throat> I've, been, I've been obviously checking out some of, uh, some of his performers, but could you tell us a bit more about who Charles Stratton was? Yes, yeah, so Charles Stratton, um, he was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1838. His, um, Mum was a part-time cleaner and his father was a carpenter. So he didn't come from, uh, he came from humble beginnings. And it was in the winter of 1842. So just under a year after Barnum had bought the American Museum. And he was in Bridgeport, Connecticut, meeting his half brother. And he heard about Charles Stratton, who um, at four years old was only 23 inches tall. And when Barnum heard about Charles Stratton, he thought, I must meet this this, this toddler, this child. And when he met him, he was absolutely amazed by Charles Stratton. He was uh, vivacious, he was friendly, um, he was outgoing. And so Barnum decided, he talks about in his autobiography, embarking on an experiment, that he was gonna take Charles Stratton, put him on at the American Museum and see whether he could make a success out of Charles Stratton. So Barnum then decides, and this goes back to our discussion about the difference between a freak performer and a freak, he decides to construct this freak persona for Charles Stratton. And this freak persona was General Tom Thumb. Barnum makes him up into General Tom Thumb, inflates his age from four years old to 11 years old, changes his nationality from American to English. And then on Thanksgiving Day, 1842, puts him on at the American Museum and Charles Stratton as General Tom Thumb was a huge success. People flocked to see him. He was shipped all around America, making Barnum thousands of pounds. And Barnum then decides to take Charles Stratton on a European tour. And he begins that in 1844, arriving in Liverpool and then going with Charles Stratton to London. And initially in London, Charles Stratton was seen as a bit of a monster. Um, the press referred to him actually as a little monster. He didn't really make much of a splash. Um, but Barnum was kind of wheeling and dealing behind the scenes and a real turning point came in 1844 where Barnum got an invite to see Queen Victoria with Charles Stratton. And that was the moment that um, Charles Stratton's fortunes really changed. I mean, we have got to the Victorians. Um, they are obsessed with bodies, aren't they? What is deformitomania? Well, so deformitomania is thanks to Charles Stratton and P.T. Barnum. So they go to Queen Victoria um, and she writes in her diary, having met Tom Thumb, 
that he was a great curiosity, the greatest curiosity I or indeed anybody ever saw, she writes. And Barnum mercilessly exploits this meeting between Charles Stratton and Queen Victoria. He peddles it in the press and suddenly everyone wants to see Charles Stratton as Tom Thumb. He's referred to as the pet of the palace and the press pick up on this and they refer to this new mania for Tom Thumb as deformitomania, an obsession uh, with the anomalous body. Because as a result of Tom Thumb's success, other dwarf performers come to London to ride the wave of this deformitomania, many of whom also meet Queen Victoria. And uh, yes, in the 1840s, uh, thanks to Charles Stratton, P.T. Barnum and Queen Victoria, this deformitomania, an obsession with the anomalous body, really picks off and, and the freak show is a, becomes kind of at the centre of uh, popular culture. John, where does, the, where does Charles Darwin come into the story and, and why? Yeah, so, I mean, you've got in the 1840s that the freak show has gone from being this marginal, transitory affair connected with the likes of Bartholomew to becoming this respectable, popular, uh, permanent theatrical form of entertainment. And that continues right up into the late 19th century. And Charles Darwin really comes into it um, shortly after he publishes On the Origin of Species in 1859. And freak showmen were exceptionally shrewd and they made their, their shows very topical. And they kind of tapped in to Darwin's uh, theory of evolution, which was really discombobulating uh, man's relationship to ape. And what they started to do was advertise so-called missing links, the links between ape uh, and man in the form of um, so-called monkey girls or hairy men, hairy, uh, hairy women. And so what they started to do was use Darwin's theories as a means of advertising different uh, freak performers. And um, Darwin himself was actually... Uh, would, was associated with a couple of the freak shows himself, writing about uh, a number of performers as well. So it was Darwin's theory that was really used by showmen to help advertise their exhibits. I mean, yeah, you've mentioned uh, hairy women. So just how popular were freak shows in their golden age? And Julie Pastrana, she was very famous, wasn't she? Tell us about her. Julia Pastrana, yeah, she's... Um, you know, it's funny when researching and writing all of this, there's some characters that kind of really pulled uh, at my heartstrings. And it's, you know, I, I really tried to kind of give a voice to the performers as much as possible because it's quite easy to, um, you know, sensationalise. And a lot of their histories have been sensationalised. And Julia Pastrana was one of those characters that, that really spoke to me. Um, there is no birth or baptism records uh, enabling us to reconstruct her early life but she was probably born in Mexico. Um, she had hair all over her body and a uh, rather overgrown uh, set of gums. And she kind of first enters the freak show scene in 1854 in New York, where, he, where she's being displayed as the bear lady or the baboon lady. Um, and she comes under the, the ownership, for want of a better word, of this rather shadowy figure named Theodore Lent, who is a manager. He's a bit of a bastard, to be honest, who pre previously dabbled in, in prostitution. And uh, in 1855, he actually marries Julia Pastrana as a means to kind of gain control over her. Anyway, he kind of displays her around uh, Europe and America. And in 1860, she get, gives birth um, to a baby boy born with the same congenital uh, deformities. And both mother and child die shortly after labor. And in a rather sort of sick turn to the phrase, the show must go on, Theodore Lent decides to embalm his dead wife and child and continue with the show. Um, and how kind of Charles Darwin comes into this is she is displayed again as the embalmed nondescript in 1862 in London. And Barnum actually includes, uh, sorry, Barnum, Darwin actually includes a study of Julia Pastrana um, in one of his uh, studies on on anomalies. So she has this really sort of quite tragic life. Apparently on her deathbed, she, she claimed that Theodore Lent loves me for my own sake. Um, but his uh, actions after she died would suggest otherwise. And 
he'd actually go on to marry another bearded lady who would perform alongside the dead, stuffed, embalmed Julia Pastrana. And he actually Just... ends up going insane in a mental asylum in Russia. Get the actual muffins. well yeah good because i know the level of exploitation <laughs> is just like heartbreaking on some of these isn't it yeah yeah I absolutely mean, that brings us uh talking about heartbreaking things that brings us on to uh, the topic of uh, john merrick really because we can't we can't talk about victorian freak shows without talking about him and um tell us what is he no best known by why is he also a good example of the decline of the freak show and what actually killed the industry in the end? Well, so the thing about Joseph Merrick is he's known as the elephant man and in many ways as the sort of archetypal Victorian freak. And he became most well known, I think, as a result of David Lynch's film, The Elephant Man. And his, his story really taps into this question of exploitation. And it's a really complicated one because on the one hand, the freak show is a history of exploitation and coercion. But on the other hand, there is also uh, an element of empowerment and choice in the freak show. Just going very briefly back to Chang and Eng, I mean, they made about $10,000 from their, their work in the freak show and they retired in North Carolina. They fathered over 21 children. They married two local sisters and became slave owners themselves. And that's kind of mad. And that was enabled by their time in the freak show. And similarly, with someone like Joseph Merrick, we know about, through the film, the, uh, his tragic tale and the exploitation that he suffered at the hands of freak showmen. But what we're not told, um, certainly in that film, is that Joseph Merrick actually decided to enter the freak show himself because of his extreme deformities. Uh, he couldn't find work and he ended up in a workhouse, in the Leicester Union workhouse. Um, and, you know, as, as we know, they were places of dependency and uh, kind of horrific institutions. And Joseph Merrick wanted his own agency. He wanted to earn his own living. And how best to do that but enter the freak show. And so we've kind of got another narrative with Joseph Merrick, where there is this story of empowerment and choice that, that he experiences in the freak show. And in terms of you know, the decline of the freak show, well, that really happens or is really exemplified when he goes uh, into the London hospital under the care of Frederick Treves. Now, that's interesting in two levels. One, because his uh, showman, his London showman, a guy called Tom Norman, claims that when Merrick was institutionalised at the London hospital, that's when he was effectively made a prisoner. Um, and he lost his independence and agency in the freak show. So it kind of complicates this question of exploitation. But also in terms of the decline of the freak show, what that really shows us is that by the latter part of the 19th century, you had the rise of medicine and the rise of these institutions that were increasingly confining and containing the anomalous body. So freak performers who were once on stage were increasingly going in to mental asylums or to hospitals. Um, and so in my book, I use Joseph Merrick as a way of illuminating some of the factors that led to the decline of the freak show. And one of those big factors was the rise of medicine. Um, I wanna say, I mean, they're also the advent of the First World War and of other entertainments, uh, as we read in your book, like the music halls is something else that detracts from the freak show. I want to say that we've, isn't it a good thing we, we look back now and we realise that we don't like exploit people anymore for our entertainment and that book. <laughs> I'd be lying yeah. through my teeth, but I know it. Um, tell us what elements of how do we just, how have we adapted the freak show for today? I'm thinking of things like Love Island for a start. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I argue in my book that, you know, the freak show is an institution uh, might have declined and you know it did linger on into to the 1940s and beyond um, but its legacy lives on and and it's sort of metamorphosized into different forms of popular culture today and if you just think about some of those crucial elements of the Victorian freak show voyeurism spectacle titillation an obsession with bodies deemed different I mean that's in all forms of different popular culture whether that's our reality TV show, such as Love Island, such as Jeremy Kyle, whether that's our obsession with um, uh, the sort of 
bodies of celebrities and various bits of fat or whatever it might be that is mercilessly picked up in gossip magazines, um, whether it's in our medical documentaries, you name it, um, you'll see the sort of uh, echoes of the Victorian freak show in popular culture. And it's funny because every time I, I do this talk, I've always got someone in the audience who will highlight an aspect of popular culture where the freak show still lives on. Um, so it's certainly not left us. Uh, it's just it's just changed somewhat. Tell everyone once again about your book. Oh, that's very kind of you. So my book is The Wonders, Lifting the Curtain on the Freak Show, Circus and Victorian Age. And we kind of go from uh, the 17th century up into the 20th century, focusing on the lives of freak performers that grace this this board, uh, these boards of popular entertainment. And by focusing on their lives, I and this what we kind of think is a rather marginal, sort of strange history, the freak show. I try and show that it was a central part of the Victorian age. It created celebrities of uh, their generation. Um, and it tells us some very interesting things about the Victorians um, and, and their world. Well, it is a triumph. Um, I've read it. I highly recommend it. John, thank you so much thank for joining you. us today. Thank you very much. Um, join us tomorrow um, because we will be joined by Alina's very good friend, Israeli archaeologist and historian Gilad Jaffe, who will be talking to us about biblical archaeology, um, how you can use it to substantiate what is in the Bible and whether or not the truth is out there. Alina, you've loved doing that one, haven't you? I did, I did. He is a fabulous archaeologist, to be honest, and I wouldn't have anyone else by my side in Israel apart from him. And remember, people, stay safe, and more importantly, if you can, stay at home. This is Nighthawk signing off.